I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. Tom, would you like to make an announcement before we get rolling? Yes, absolutely. I want to welcome Kevin aboard, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. And uh, if you like the show, well, you guys know what to do. Just click the like and subscribe. And if you want to take it the extra step, you can do so. Um, just go to either patreon.com forward slash Creek Devil, or you can click on the link in the description on YouTube and just click. And, and for a little, as little as a dollar a month, you can really support the show that helps us to help you. And then I want to say, a huge thank you to Fred Sieber. He sent us a gift. Uh, Will, he sent Will one. I think you got one, didn't you, Will? I did, yes. Thank you, Fred. They're very nice. So, And I got one as well. So thank you very, very much. It's a, it's a nice coffee table book. Uh, Dave, someplace that you've heard of, North Carolina. Yeah, I believe that's where Fred's from. So... Um... Well, Kevin, is. we're going to metaphorically hand you the microphone and tell us what you've experienced. Well, I moved out to uh, Washington State probably, I think, around 2006 or something. Um, and I'd always been, you know, a believer in Big But When I was a kid, I'm 37 now, but when I was a kid, man, I remember seeing that uh, Patterson-Gimlin film, and I just knew that was real. Like, the way you watch it walk and the fur and the muscle ripple, and it just, there's no way that looks fake, so... In my mind, I already knew these things were real. Um, so I've always been interested in the topic. Um, but, you know, fast forward way later on, I moved to Washington State. Um, and obviously, this is a hot spot for these things. But uh, this was probably about, I've had a couple experiences. No visuals or anything, but I know I know they're out there because I've gotten about as close as you can get without having a visual. I can say that much. Um I want to say this was probably 2010, 2011. I can't remember which year. It was about 10, 10, 11 years ago. Um, I lived in Issaquah at the time, so on the east side of Seattle. And uh, me and my good buddy that I moved out here with, uh, we'd always, once we moved out here, we, we really got into mushroom picking. Um, you know, there's chanterelles, oysters, lobsters, all sorts of choice mushrooms out here. It's like one of the mushroom capitals of the world. And so this is kind of one of those classic you know, creeped up on one while you're picking mushroom stories. But anyways, th this is a very strange story because where we encountered this is not where you think you would ever see one of these things. And so when when this happened to me, I, I had a sus I had a feeling of what it was. I wasn't sure because I was so scared at the time. But the fact that I was in such an odd area, um, I won't give the exact location because these spots just get trampled out. But this was downtown West Seattle. Like, I'm talking in the heart of a city. You would never think in a million years these things would be here. But me and my buddy were out late one night, um, 12 a.m., 1, 1, or tw so yeah, 12 a.m., 1 a.m., something like that, um, looking for mushrooms in this one spot. And in this area, these certain mushrooms that we were picking are choice edibles, and they only grow in the fall. So you kind of wait for the first freeze, which happens around October. And then um, you get a small window to pick some of these mushroom species. So we hike into this area late one night. Um, we always go in there after it's closed. You're not supposed to be in parks after they're closed, but there's less people around. So it's just, it's more enjoyable. And, and there's something about doing it at night. It's just fun. So we hike in maybe about, it's, it's, it's a pretty decent sized park. It's not humongous. It's, it's a decent size. Um, these parks are all over the place, but we hike in. And it takes about 20 minutes to get to the spot. You have to go off trail. It's not a part of a trail where, you know, everybody is, it's way off the trails. It's not where people are always walking. You kind of have to make your own trail and cut under some logs and go through a little bit of forest. So we get back into this area back there. And all we had on us for at the time was cell phone flashlights. I don't know why we didn't have real flashlights, but we just had our cell phones, right? We're just looking at the ground, 
going real slow, going to this area. And the spot where these mushrooms are growing is it's a little ditch. It's almost like a V little ditch canyon. Um, and they grow right in the little ditch right there. Um, and then up on the hill, up off to the left, there's there's an elementary school um, and a couple of houses. So it's surrounded by some houses. The whole park is surrounded by houses. It's in a residential area. Um, so we're, we're just picking mushrooms. Uh, and we're probably at this for about 30 minutes, 45 minutes or so. And all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, it's a dead quiet, nice night. We get the classic whoops. Loud is all hell. It's just, I can't really do it, but it's just the classic whoop, whoop. And it was so loud where like you could almost feel it. And it was so out of place. I remember my friend, like we just froze in fear because we're like, this is not any normal animal you've encountered. It's not an owl. Um, we're downtown Seattle. There's not going to be any predators out here. Um, you might get coyotes, but not in downtown Seattle. You know, you get those on the outskirts of the cities. So we just froze in fear, and we looked at each other, pale. I mean, I had my flashlight, and this thing, this whoop came from maybe no more than 30 feet, roughly 30 feet. I could see the tree it came from, and I looked at the tree, and I pointed my flashlight at it, but... With the cell phone flashlight, all it does is blind yourself. You don't see anything. It's worse than actually not using a flashlight. So we froze, looked at each other, and we were like, we got to get out of here. And we just booked it out of there. We ran. Um, we were scared. We didn't know what it was. And you, we just froze with fear. Like, we instantly just froze. Um, we didn't talk about it too much. I actually, Bigfoot crossed my mind just because you get that ape monkey sound i had never heard this sound before i didn't even know bigfoot's made these sounds so at the time like we're just freaked out we go home we talk about it a little bit don't really talk about it but me i always look into everything i just go deep on any topic i get into i just i research it as hard as you can so i found the ron moorhead sound i was i was looking for what type of sound this could be i checked every bird every owl every animal that's native um, to Washington State, and nothing comes close, not even close. I mean, you get barred owls. They can make some crazy screeches and sounds that almost sound like a monkey sometimes, but this was nothing like that. It, it wasn't a barred owl, but after looking at it, I found Ron Moorhead's uh, Sierra sounds, and it was so close to what his sounds were, the whoops that he captured. The only thing I'd say it was a little bit quicker and a little bit higher pitch. I can't do it, but it was like another octave up for me. Um, but at that moment, I'm like, dude, we ran into a Bigfoot. I'm like, I didn't really talk about it with anybody because Bigfoot's crazy enough. Your friends think you're weird. But you don't expect for this to be in a downtown city. So I kind of put it in the back of my mind, right? I just, I stopped thinking about it um, for years. Um, and then later on, I mean, 10 years later, I'd always, I'd always think about this, but 10 years later, I got back into the Bigfoot subject. I'd always be into it off and on. Um, but it's hard to really go anywhere with it, right? There's only so much information out there. There's only so many new videos or new photos. There's not a lot of new stuff that comes out that's, you know, groundbreaking. So I had a friend living in out here at the time who was also into the topic. She'd moved out here and uh, we were like, you know what? Let's just go out looking for these things. Like, why not? Right. Let's research this and just go out. She had some experiences too in California. So, um, before we started going out, I had actually wanted to report this. So, you know, I looked at like, hey, who's taking these reports? So, so I obviously you'd find, B you type in Bigfoot reports, you find BFRO. It's what everybody finds. Um, so I read, I've read every single report on BFO. I, I, I've read them all in the state. There's a bunch on there. They don't update it too often, but um, so I, I said in my report, reached out, an investigator reached out to me, a really cool guy. Um, so I told him exactly what happened to me. And he's like, oh yeah. Um, you would not believe it, but he actually does, you know, some lectures and he focuses on urban Sasquatch and how these things come into right in around houses, right in around cities. You know, people think you have to go way out for these things. You can, they're out there, but often they're down here just on the outskirts of civilization. I mean, so I told him about the spot and then he made an awesome connection that I didn't even think of at the time. And I was telling him how it was next to a school and he's like, Oh, there's a, a school there. He's like, what kind of school? And I was like, oh, yeah, there's an elementary school just right up on the hill right here. He's like, wow, that's that's fascinating because, you know, Bigfoot are known for watching children. That They actually love watching children. 
Um, for whatever reason, they're fascinated. It draws them in. You know, if you have kids with you or you're at school, um, you got a better chances of encountering these things because they do love children. If you research this topic, I'm sure you guys know, a lot of the times children are a component. So um, in this spot, what I, what I believe is I think this spot is kind of a seasonal spot. I know they're not in here um, throughout the summer and most of the months. I think, you know, one of these things comes through this spot only in fall i think i think in the in the, around fall um and winter is when they move into some of these lower areas around houses and they kind of get out of the weather and follow some of the food sources um so this one i believe we were in there in november picking the mushrooms that's when i encountered it um and it's got everything it's got i think it comes in there and it watches the children i honestly do i think it's kind of an entertainment spot for them or something or or they're also eating the mushrooms in there i don't know but there's a reason this thing comes in out there. I think it comes in often because uh, I know they don't like game cams. Um, you put a game cam out, chances are you're going to scare them off. They can see the infrared um, is what we think. But I was like, oh, well, you know what? Some people do get lucky and do catch a glimpse on, on game cams. So I put I went in there last year, um, and this is 10, 11 years after this happened. And I was like, you know what? These things are probably coming in there every year in a certain month. So I put a game cam up there and I left it in from November to January. So you know, roughly about three months, maybe just under three months. And so I go to pick up that game camera after, you know, mid January or so. And there's a bunch of footage on it. Most of the footage is kids finding it because it's a spot where you can hike back. Um, and, you know, there's other mushroom pickers that go in there and they take their children so most of my game cam footage that I got out of there, I had to watch a bunch of it. That's the thing with game cams, you get all this random footage, but um, a lot of children. So here we go again. We have children in this area where I ran into this thing um, that are coming in and out of this spot. And I had one guy find him. He's like, oh, hey, a game cam. When you see him, you walk up. He walks up to it, puts his hand on it. Um, and you, you can obviously tell it's a human. You see him, you hear him. Um, typically game cameras, a human is just going to stumble upon it. They don't even know it's there. Or if they do know it's there, they're going to touch it or they're going to look at it. You're going to see a human. And then I'm going through the captures and I have this one strange capture. I mean, it's, it's not proof by any means, but it's with my history in the spot. And I know what goes on there. It's, it's very weird. Um, I actually have the video posted on my Instagram page, which is Sasquatch Enigma Explorations. If anyone wants to see it, basically all the video is, is, and I didn't even notice this when I first watched it, but um, something comes up to the camera, unlatches it, and flips the camera open. Um, Will, I sent you this video. You saw it. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but in the bottom left corner, you can see just a little brown patch of hair. You can't see any skin. You can't see any hands. Nothing. You just see a little patch of hair. Sure, it could be a human, right? We, we don't know. It could be a human sneakily sneaking up on an opening it flipping it and closing it. I don't know why anyone would go in there and do that because of every game cam I've ever left out and every game capture I've ever had is always a human stumbling upon it. They put their hands in front of it. You hear them talking, they walk by it. But in this one spot where I had this encounter, uh, there's a little brown patch of hair in the bottom left corner. That's all you can see. It just moves for a couple seconds um, and it flips the camera open and closes it. And another strange thing is I had another game camera behind it that was pointed uh, right at it, slightly off to the right of it. Uh, but anytime I set up cameras, I always I usually try and do three cameras where I have them all looking at each other. Um, it just it will just increase your odds if something is trying to avoid it or get around it in my mind. So but it, the other camera did not capture anything. It didn't pick this up. So this thing knew to avoid the other one come in from the side, kind of flank the camera from the left, unlatch it close it it didn't take the batteries out it didn't reset the camera it did nothing you actually can't you need a code um and it continued to capture footage after this so nothing was wrong with the camera and that's that's my story for this this up to this point in this area is you know i ran into this thing whoop, whooped at us scared us out of our pants we ran out of there 10 years later i put some game cameras up not not expecting to capture anything because i know they avoid these things like the plague but, you know, I, I like to work while I'm sleeping. So if I can put some stuff out anyways, you know, maybe you'll get the unicorn, right? So I don't know if this is a Bigfoot. I, I never make claims like this is what it is, but it's very interesting. So um, that's kind of the first part of one of my encounters. That, that's probably the most 
um, impressive encounter that I've had. I've had some rock throwing and some screams we can get into. Um, did you guys have any questions up to this point or? Everybody's quiet. They're listening. Hey, Kevin, this is Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I like this because it's so unique and different. Um, I did hear of a uh, similar story. I think it was in Bellingham where some lady was on a bike path and she was coming around the corner. It was a walking path. that was uh, definitely an urban area. And, uh, and there was one right in front of her and it really, I, you know, terrified her oddly enough. Nobody ever comes back and said, these are wonderful encounters. <laughs> but what I always wonder is um, how do they get to these locations? So I'm asking you to help us. Okay. I, I have a good idea here. Um, does like it, I said, does I, it have, does it have concealment to get there? I guess that's the long winded way of it, asking that question. There's green belts. So if you look at maps, um, I've been pouring over maps like crazy, um, just looking for spots to go. Cause I'm actually actually actively going out and, you know, exploring this phenomena or I call it an enigma cause that's what it is. It's, it's so bizarre and we don't have answers, but what I believe is happening and what I'm almost sure of this spot is they're swimming across the Puget Sound from Bainbridge Island. These things are Olympic swimmers. They can out, they can swim like you wouldn't believe it. Um, there's some good books written about Sasquatch and how much they love water. Uh, like Rain Coast Sasquatch is an awesome book. But these things definitely love water, which is which is weird because I'd like to point out that you know gorillas and stuff like that typically don't like water. They don't like to swim. So we have a trade here where these things love swimming. Um, so. If you look at Google Maps, you'll see that these things, there's lots of reports on the islands. Uh, you know, all those islands out there in the sound have Bigfoot reports. And so I really do believe that at this time of the year in fall, I don't think they're coming over here necessarily for food. Maybe they are eating the mushrooms. I don't know. Maybe it's an entertainment thing. Maybe it's a juvenile or, you know, a teen. They like to have fun. Um, but they're swimming across the sound. I'm almost positive of it because there's no real good green belts that are going to get you from that side of the, you know, Olympic Peninsula over here. Um, and these things are known swimmers. So in my mind, I really do believe that they are swimming across the sound at nighttime and coming over here in the fall and winter months, if that makes any sense. Sounds crazy, well, but that's what I think is happening. There have been, uh, uh, indications and sightings of them uh, swimming the Columbia River. So uh, <clears throat> that does not necessarily surprise me at all. Yeah, it's not. It's they, a, I mean, it's a, it's a big distance to swim that, but I don't think it's anything for these things. Um, there's lots of reports on all these islands out here where these things are at, so they have to be swimming to them. Yeah, well, they're found on islands uh, off the coast of Alaska, too. So. You know. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard that. Hey, Kevin. Go ahead. This is David. Um, on the game camera where you said it, it looked like it opened it up and you could see like a brown a brown patch of fur, was yeah. there any audio on that recording by chance? Could you hear it coming or was it just the video? There is audio. The game cameras don't have the best audio. Um, but yes, you can hear it open up. You can hear it kind of fumbling with it and it's shaking and it unlatches it it has to unlatch it because it had a lot like latched clothes with two latches flips it open you, go ahead could you hear it coming like foot by no. head footsteps nope. or anything nope you cannot hear anything coming okay no no sound coming up. what you can hear is if you listen and i posted the whole thing because i don't like with my my page i post this instagram page i'm trying to put stuff out there that's just unedited and real and you know whatever i get is what i get i'm not trying to fool anyone trick anybody i want to you know try and find some evidence and put real stuff out so what you can hear at the end of this video is uh, a female's voice and so the criticism of this video is that oh that's a person because you can hear a lady in the video right well no because this spot where the camera is and where I had my encounter is, a, is about 30 yards up the side of a hill, maybe even less as the playground of the elementary school. And so you hear children and teachers out there yelling at the kids all day long. I've gone in here in the daytime um, and this video was captured in the daytime. It's a daytime video. So in my opinion, the, the little bit of female voice you hear at the end, and I'll send you guys the actual raw video because when it uploads to Instagram, it almost gets cropped a little bit and you can't see as much. 
So, Will, I'll send you the full unedited video after this okay. so you guys can all look at it. Great. But I think the female sound is actually one of the teachers up on the hill yelling at a kid or yelling at the children on the playground. And so, you know, here you, again, you might have a Bigfoot down here with kids in the area. I, these things love children, I'm telling you. They'll, they'll watch them from school playgrounds. If you got a playground near a forest out here, there's probably a Bigfoot in there watching children on the playground. So in my mind, everything adds up in this spot. It's got everything. It's so bizarre that it's in downtown Seattle, but it, it has all the cover they need. You know, maybe they're foraging mushrooms, too. It's watching the children. Um, I've kind of just connected. It's taken me years to connect all the dots here, but um, it, it all lines up to me. Well, Will, I, uh, I think you can uh, you can attest to this. There's been historical accounts for these uh, uh, for Bigfoot having a fascination with children. Uh, I mean, we've got the cowmen uh, of Kapalas, and uh, we've got very other other very disturbing uh, stories about them peering in windows and such. And and then uh, there have been several uh, oh other shows, and we won't we won't. <laughs> mention the shows, but they've always, they seem to have had a number of people that indicated that there were Bigfoot that uh, were seen watching the children. That was when they were actually sighted. So it's that's rather disturbing to me. I've, I've They're checking out the menu. I've interviewed quite a few people. Um, in fact, there was one up here uh, in Southern Oregon just a few years ago, and I sent someone up there to um, helped drive them away because it kept ramping up and, and the family was really getting frightened. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a good thing usually when they do that. It, it is very strange. I mean, I've talked to people, I've talked to a few Bigfoot, you know, invest quote investigators and everybody's got their opinion. Um, obviously there's native American lore of them taking children or women. Right. Um, and, but I've talked to investigators that have actively investigated Washington State for 15 years, and they say, no, they're completely harmless. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm from and Puyallup, they, so I, I worked there for oh, wow. many, many, many years before I moved to yeah. Northern California. So, uh, no, they are not harmless. They are an apex predator, I, and they will they, – they do have a propensity at times to eat people. So, yeah, you want to be extremely careful. Yeah, I agree. I mean – who knows what these things are capable of, right? You got missing people. You got all sorts of stories. People have never been found. I mean, in my opinion, the only way you're never going to be found is if you were digested, Pretty right? Much, you're usually yeah. going to find a, you're going to find a bone. You're going to find some clothing, some shoes, but like, and I'm real careful. I, I know about all these missing people and I, I know that there's stuff out there that we don't know about. And, um, I always go out armed. I would never shoot one of these things, obviously, unless I absolutely had no choice. But good thinking. I go right. to. Area. Well, yep. Uh, go ahead. This is Chuck, and I and I would say to you that that they are definitely coming into urban areas. I mean, uh, we've we've had that happen down here in Oklahoma, uh, lots of times, and they are coming in. And uh, there's a lot of reasons behind that why they're coming into the cities, and. Um, you know, it's something to be watchful for and something to be careful for. That's for sure. I mean, yeah, I definitely think safety in numbers, right? I usually go out with, with a person or somebody or, you know, I'll take my girlfriend out. She's um, she's awesome. She's amazing because she – I think part of her thinks I'm out there chasing unicorns. But <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> she's not a 100% believer, so I'm always trying to get her to, you know, look at the evidence and stuff. But – she loves she doesn't mind that i go out you know this this can wreck a lot of her relationships or do a lot of damage but she's awesome so i go out you know whenever i want um the problem is is finding other people to go out with right like not a lot of people want to go out and look for bigfoot uh 90 percent of the time it's boring there's no action you're i, I tell in people a car, that you're all the time <laughs> and it's, it's yeah. so much boredom attached to it i've done this 50 years now um i guess i'm just stubborn but you know, and you're right. Never go alone. Um, I put out my my newest book was a my field guide, and that's one of the things I stated in there is do not ever go alone. And here's here's a tip for you too. If you happen to be out, and this has worked, we've actually had people do this. Um, if there's you know if there's only say two of you, and and you feel like you're being surrounded, they're coming in. You know, talk out loud like you're pretending there are other people there. 
it really throws them off. They they kind of watch they watch to see how many people are present, and if they think there's more people present, it'll kind of put off um, any aggressive behaviors that they're exhibiting. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, I definitely think if they think there's a lot of you, they're going to be maybe more cautious. But absolutely, I, I I do believe if you're out there alone and there's one of you and they if there's an opportunistic one, I, you know, I think some of these I think maybe there's a lot of good ones or fine ones or neutral ones. And there I think are. just like humans. Yeah. Yep. You got a lot of great humans, but you got a portion of horrible humans. These things are probably similar in that manner. You got a lot of a lot of good ones that are going to leave you alone. Don't want to be near you. And then you got some rogue, nasty ones. So in my mind, I'm always keeping that in the back of my mind. You never know what you're dealing with, so you got to be careful. Well, you know, um, it's like any other wildlife. You know, if you were going to go, let's say, study grizzlies in Montana, you wouldn't just go wandering out thinking, oh, they're they're such nice animals, they're misunderstood. Like, remember, Forrest, the, the two people up in Alaska that were saying oh, things like that, and they camped yeah. out near the bears, and they ended up the bears ate them? <laughs> yes, I can't. I can't remember that gentleman's name, and I really I felt sorry for the girlfriend because he coerced her he into coming into out. Yeah. She didn't want to. Yeah, and he got her into that situation, and they got killed. I mean, most of the bears, if they're they're well fed and they're, uh, you know, they they won't bother you seriously. Uh, I mean, yeah, they're opportunistic hunters, but the one that got them was an older bear that had bad teeth. And let's face it, humans are. We don't understand. We're on the the food chain, and we're not, um, you know, we're not fleet of foot like a deer, um, and we're not big like a bison, and we really present pretty easy prey. So, you know, and that that bear took advantage of the situation, and it just turned out to be a tragic and a very sad situation, totally. Hey, hey Forrest, you know, I just had a revelation from what you were saying there. That explains why so many old people concentrate at Denny's. You know, because it's, it's... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I'm I'm older, so I can say that. <laughs> I'm thinking now. Wait a minute. Now, if we're, we're older and well, opportunistic and not able to, uh, you know, get those meals as easy as we used to, maybe we need to go somewhere where it's easier. <laughs> sorry, hey, well, I couldn't resist. This, this, this is the reason I told Chuck if I was going to go out bigfoot and with him. I was going to definitely hang a T-bone steak around his neck and front and back. So oh. that way. Uh... <laughs> yeah. That, I'm sorry, that's Chuck. That's pretty mean to the blind guy. That's pretty mean to the blind guy. <laughs> Just saying. Well, Kevin, what else have but you experienced? Chuck, my friend. Oh. <laughs> well, what are... Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, fast forward a little bit. Um, my buddy moves out here and you now you know, we decided to go out a little bit. And so I've already read every freaking report on the state. There's a there's an awesome app called what's that guy's name? Oh, it's called Bigfoot Mapping Project. Have you guys heard of him? He's got a really cool what's app. It? It's called Bigfoot Mapping. Company? Yeah, it's just an app you can get on iPhone or um, Android. And he's basically just compiled all the reports and put them onto one map. Um, so, you know, I got his app and I read all the BFR post, our posts. So before we went, started going out, you know, I did a ton of research on areas and I'm like, well, I'm only about an hour and 20 minutes from Mount Rainier. So let's go check out Mount Rainier. And this was our first night out. So, you know, we leave in the morning and we're out at Mount Rainier all day. Um, my buddy Chanel, she's, she's out there. We're, we're driving up all these roads and I'm going, you know, in areas where I think they could be, you know, I typically like, I think it, they always travel near water. I think. These things are never really too far from water. So I'm always trying to stick to like rivers or streams or creek beds or, or whatever, right? Anywhere where there's water. Um, so we're out there all day, though. We're, we're all over the place. But she's a whooper. She loves going out and doing the whoops and stuff. Um, not so much. I'm not too into doing that. Um, I do a little bit, you know, just for fun here or there. But she was going crazy all day our first day out and just whooping and going nuts. Um so we're out there a good, let's see, we probably started at noon and didn't get back till 2 a.m. that night. But what happened on this, in this occasion is we, we've gone all over Ashford is where we're at, Ashford, Mount Rainier, the park, um, all of the blogging roads out there. And on the way back home, we decided to go up this one road one last time that we first went up when we got there. And this road is right around in Ashford. Um, and so... I'm driving up there and, you know, she's recording on her cell phone already, which was smart. I wasn't recording because I was driving. 
But we get up to this area, and and right when we pull up to this area, we hear the most gnarly, craziest screams like you would not believe. Um, it sounded to me, my first impression of these screams was, oh my god, a backcountry hiker is being mauled by a mountain lion and having his arms just chewed off. That was my first instinct, like no joke, because I heard more than one scream. I heard multiple screams. It sounded like maybe four or five things screaming at the top of their lungs. It sounded like a woman screaming bloody murder. And it sounded like a man dying. It sounded like, uh, you know, somewhat like a mountain lion at the top of its lungs, but it didn't sound like a mountain lion or maybe like a bear, but didn't sound like a bear either. Just this hodgepodge of it. And we got audio of this. So she was in the passenger side and she recorded it. I started recording. I recorded. So we both have recordings. Um, I typically use hers. We typically use hers because she was on the passenger side of the vehicle and that's where they're coming from. So hers picked it up just a little bit better. Um, I had actually sent these screams to Will. Will, do you have these like that you can play for people? Uh, I believe I do. Yes. In fact, I know that I know that area very well. I've heard a lot of stuff up there myself. Yeah, they're definitely there. I mean, I've talked to several people, and there's definitely a, 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 I call them clans, and we don't really have a name for these things, but I refer to Sasquatch as clan, and clans. I think they just are in family units most of the time, and little little groups of family units, so I call them clans. But there's definitely, I think there's a couple clans around right here, more than one. There's there's a few of these things. In fact, I'll, um, uh, I'll, but, I'll attach that audio to the end of this uh, show. Okay, yeah, yeah, play it. The cool thing about this audio is... It really okay. When these things scream, we, I've heard it a couple times. You no, there is no audio recorder that can do these things justice. It blows the audio recorder out. They're hitting frequencies that the auto, like a phone or even a, a decent audio recorder, can't pick up on. And the volume in person is so much louder than what you can hear from a phone. I mean, put this thing in your car stereo and turn it till your stereo is clipping and blasting, like, and you're still not even gonna get there. So, I mean, the cool thing about this audio is she was absolutely terrified, shaking, scared out of her mind, like convulsing, no joke. She was very scared. And it was terrifying. We were both scared. Um, so the cool thing about this audio is it, it gives a lot of realism as to what it is like when you encounter these screams, because they are out of this world. They're like no animal in the forest. They're not foxes. They're not cougars. They're not bears. They're not a group of them. They're not porcupines. Um like I said, I've listened to every sound I can find, every auto recording of every animal I can find, and nothing comes close to these things. And I've sent this to other quote researchers. They've run it through spectral analysis, and you know, a few people have said that it is uh, consistent with other known Sasquatch vocals. So, um, you know, in my mind, I'm not 100. I can't say these are Sasquatch 100. I believe they are. Um, I believe it's as close as you can, you know, know without having any other type of evidence or animals or anything to compare it to that you know sounds like this um so you can either play that now or play it later it's up to you yeah i'll, I'll play it at the end of the uh at the end of the show that way people can they can kind of run it okay, back and awesome. forth and listen yeah that was one of our uh you know one of our best pieces of evidence is you know i had my my own stuff happen to me that i already talked about and then you know our first night out we get these incredible screams where we're like holy you know what um, so you guys will hear those and you'll hear how real it is, um, what it's like to actually be around this in person. It's, it's like, it's, like I said, it's out of this world. So, yep, that, that's the screams. That's one of the next pieces of really good evidence that I've, that we've gotten so far. Um, let's see here. Backtrack a little bit. There was another time, um, a few years back, maybe five or six years ago, where I was at, out camping with some buddies and this was near... Lake Cushman. It wasn't at the lake, but it was it was some rivers, you know, behind Lake Cushman. So, you know, we're out there camping with a few people, and uh, there's five of us, and it's twilight, dusk, and me and my buddy go up to the river, and we're just hanging out, you know, watching the river, and it's just nice out. And the other three, they they walked off in the opposite direction of us just to go for a little hike or whatever. And me and my friend are just sitting at the river there, and all of a sudden we start having these rocks thrown at our feet. Like this is a classic rock throwing story. Um, from across the river, uh, to the right of us, there's a bridge, there's the road, a dirt road that goes over a bridge. And then it's just super dense forest. Like you, you can't walk into this spot. I I've gone back and I've looked at it. 
you couldn't walk down in there and a human be back there if you wanted to. It's just crazy. Well, you know how the forest is out here. It's, oh, yeah. it's so thick and dense. It's insane how some areas are literally just impenetrable. But you know, we're standing at the, the riverside, and all of a sudden we have all these rocks being thrown right at our feet, right in the water, maybe about you know a three-foot radius around us. Um, and, and they're river rocks. I, I noticed I'm, I'm a super detailed person in general because my, uh, my career is in dentistry, so I manage a dental laboratory. So details are everything. So anytime anything happens anywhere, I'm always looking at the details. But these rocks were river rocks. And in Washington, you don't get a lot of rocks anyways. If you walk out in the, the woods, you're not really finding rocks. You'd have to dig um, through all the layers of leaves and vegetation and through the soil to even start finding rocks. So these came from the river. Um, they they weren't as big as a golf ball. They were similar in size, but you know a lot flatter and smoother. Um, but this happened for a couple minutes where these things were throwing rocks at us at our feet. And my buddy was like, I was like, holy crap, something's throwing rocks at us. And my buddy's like, oh, that's just the other um, our other friends. They're over there pranking us. He he literally believed that they had hiked into this area and were throwing rocks to prank us. No, nope, no way, no chance in heck. Um, so in my mind, I knew what it was. <laughs> I had already been like, they're freaking Bigfoot over there. You're only going to have humans and Bigfoot throw rocks. And that's it. And Bigfoot, when they throw rocks, they're actually super, super accurate. Like they weren't trying to hit us. They could hit us if they could. But they're just throwing them right at our feet, right into the water, right in the shoreline. And it happened for a couple minutes. And then finally, he just wanted to kind of walk away. So. We walked away, but that, you know, I chalked it up as another encounter for me. It's not a visual. None of these are visuals, but they're about as close as the visuals as you, I mean, as close as you can get besides having a visual, knowing that something is there that is, is not like, you know, something we know about. So that was an interesting one. Those, those rocks being thrown at us. I, I, I do chalk that up as kind of a little encounter there. Um, that's probably, that's probably my third one. We found a couple prints, um, not, not, nothing amazing, a decent prints. You know, I'm really hoping to find a super nice print this fall or this, uh, you know, summer here just because I have dental stones so I can cast a really detailed print if I find one. And, and I've been practicing here and there on just some other stuff like animal prints and stuff just to pull a nice one. So next time I find one, I'm going to definitely cast it, but you know, you got to get crazy lucky to even find a footprint. You can go out there. I've gone out quite a few times this year. I'm usually trying to go out one to two times a week. Um, right now, I'm actually building a camper van. So I've been putting the last this month, I've kind of been going crazy on building this up so I can take that out there and kind of camp in it. I'm not sleeping in a tent ever again because I know it's out there. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I won't do it. I, I don't, yeah, I won't do it. I don't have any. My friends. Yeah, I don't have any interest in being a burrito. <laughs> no, nope. my friends call me Wuss, but I'm like, you yeah, can go ahead and tent camp all you want. You don't know what I know. So I'm gonna, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm gonna build a van. At least have a little bit of metal in me too. I know it's not. I know they could punch a hole in the side of it if they want to, but whatever. It's some type of deterrent, or yeah. at least give me a little bit of warning. So, I psycho- can sleep a little. Bit. Right. Psychologically, it's better anyway. And I've always, I've never been able to sleep camping, even since I was a kid. I, I, when I sleep and camp in a tent, I don't sleep one wink because I'm always on high alert. I just don't trust what's out there. So that's ingrained in me anyways. Like ever since seeing those Bigfoot videos when I was a kid and all that, the Patty film. And so, but yeah, I try and get out one or two times a week. Um, This year, you know, I'm trying to set a goal. Like this year, I really want to try and get some hair and get a hair sample. So I've kind of devised some a couple little clever traps where I'm going to put them up in winter because in my mind, I think these creatures are going to be, well, they avoid human anything like the plague. Like you set something human out there, they're just going to avoid it. But I'm going to try and I'm just going to try and bait them a little bit, you know, with some fat, um, some high fat in some really cold, snowy winter areas where they've been known to be. And, Get you know, you a some, hammock. do what? Get you a hammock. Is the is, is, is hammock a good a tactic? Oh, it's a good tactic. What, just hang out in the hammock or just put the hammock up? Put the hammock up and sleep in it. Oh, man, oh. I, don't know if I, could, I don't know if I could do that. Uh, but I'm going to try and get some hair. So if I get any hair, it might, it might not happen. It probably won't happen, but I think it's possible. Where if you Sometimes there are reports of the people seeing these things and they look emaciated. Have you ever guys have heard of any of these where they look like they're starving and oh, had yeah. a rough winter? Yeah. I used, to, so, I used to have a guy tell me about that in Vancouver when I lived there. So, well, yeah, what I'm doing is I'm making this trap that's going to pull hair, and I'm, I'm mixing peanut butter, um, bacon fat, and lard. 
And so if if you if there's one out there and he's hungry and he needs fat, you know, that's the number one thing you need. You don't need protein or carbs. You need fat when you're starving. Hey, so Kev, if I, go ahead. If you're looking for hair, look in a bird's nest. Okay, yeah. That's a little bit more tough to do because you got to get up in the trees, but sometimes you do find those. Yeah. Um, that's Yeah, that's great. I'll keep an eye out. Um, you know, the structures is another thing a lot of people talk about is – a lot of people think, you know, those are people building them or Bigfoot's building them. I tend to think that it is possible that Bigfoot are making these weird stick structures in the middle of the forest where people typically don't go. I don't see any reason why someone would make these things. Um, so I found a couple weird structures. You know, I, I've come across them. Um, they're obviously built by something. And so I'm always checking those out for prints and hair really close. I'll spend, I'll spend an hour on a structure just eyeballing the heck out of it to see if there's any evidence. Uh, but yeah, that's my goal this year. I'm going to try and get some more sounds. I always take an audio recorder out with me now, and I just leave that thing running the entire time because um, if anything's going to happen, it's going to happen when you absolutely are not thinking about it and you're least expecting it, and it's going to be out of the blue. So you're either recording or you're not. So I try and you know take a recorder, hide it, um, tape over the light so it's not shining, so it doesn't seem like you have anything on you. And then besides you know, trying to get some more audio, hopefully I – oh, also I bought a really nice ATM thermal. Um, and I've been just driving up and down logging roads and, um, I have like a big iPad mounted in my car so I can wirelessly over Wi-Fi record with the thermal to my iPad, which is a complete game changer. I just got this thing. So, and you can see really, really well, if anything's out there, I'm going to get it. Um, there's been a couple instances where I've been driving and I've seen something in the woods and it's just a flash, right? Um, there was one instance where we're driving and I, we see something, a, a nice heat signature standing up against the tree, but we weren't recording. You know, it, it had to have either been a bear standing or, you know, a Sasquatch or a human. It wasn't a human because there was no humans where we're at. But, you know, we saw it for a second. I was driving and it's like, oh, crap, what was that? Back up. You back up and it's gone. It's just not there. And you're like, damn it, I should have been filming. So the key is, is you have to be filming 24 7 you got to get a big memory card you got to have batteries you got backup batteries backup memory cards and you just gotta you just gotta record so um right now you know it'd be awesome to get some thermal something on thermal that's that's my kind of my main goal um that and maybe try and get some hair so uh, that's kind of what i'm going to be focused on this year and then fall i think fall is just an incredible time to go out for these things because I think and I believe that, you know, in fall, they're coming closer in, they're coming off the mountains and they're coming closer to civilization. Um, I tend to believe in summer, you know, they kind of retreat because summer, everybody's out. Everybody and everybody is just out tramping all over the woods. And I think they kind of, you know, in the summer, in the daytime, they retreat up to the uh, the ridges, the high ridges and the higher mountains. They come down, sure. They're always moving. But, you know, generally, I think they're a little bit higher up in the summer. I could be wrong. It's just a hunch I have. Um, I think they're a little bit more away in the summer, a little higher up, you know, kind of avoiding all that human activity or staying on the outskirts. But in the fall, they got to eat and they got to bulk up for winter. So they're coming. That's why you always have hunters encountering these things in hunting season in the fall is because all the deer and the elk and the hunters and the Sasquatch are all conjugating in the same areas for these food sources, you know, to try and bulk up before winter. So that's when you get a lot of activity and sightings with Sasquatches in the fall time um, and springtime. Um, from what I can gather and what I've read, those are your best, you know, high odd sightings or chances is in those two seasons right there, right at the changing of the seasons. So, hey, Kev, go ahead. Have there ever been any sightings or reports around the school? Um, the school where I encountered one? Yeah. No, I can't find anything. So, you know, I think typically when these there have been sightings uh, around schools that I know of in on the Olympic Peninsula, usually on the Indian reservations. Um, and that's another thing is Native Americans, Indian reservations, Sasquatch, those things go together like hand and glove. So you put some kids in the mix there and you got a perfect spot for some Sasquatch activity. But there are some schools out on the Olympic Peninsula around Quinault and uh, La Push and some of those areas where there have been a lot of sightings of these things uh, near the schools and near the playgrounds. Typically, they're going to stay in the woods, and they may peek out from a tree. And But, you know, I think a lot of the times they're just in the woods, and you can't see them, but they're in there. So um, schools, school sightings out here are, are a thing. They for sure are a thing. Well, you may look like a nut to some people, but you might want to think about telling them about the schools. 
Oh, you mean telling the schools about what's been going on? Tell somebody. Yeah, um, that's not a bad idea. Um, you know, what, what are they going to do, right? Are they going to stop having kids go out and think, you know, but like you exactly. said, it's at least at least you told them, right? Yeah. So that's that is a good idea. Maybe I'll do that. Um, let's see here. Well, I've had another I've had some other interesting encounters. You know, I've had a lot of these little things like a little clues, and little hints, nothing. The, the ones I've already told you were the biggest. But well, there was one night where I went out with my buddy to um, Harstein Island. Harstein Island out here has had several reports. And one night me and my buddy went out there this last winter. Um this last winter and we were out there and we we're you know walking through some thick forests we should have been recording but we weren't but we had um really interesting eye shine you know the t- tough thing about eye shine is you don't really know what it is it could be an animal it could be a deer but we had this one really weird eye shine where we're walking out in the woods and about 20 feet out from us these eyes look at us and they stand up and they walk off like real fluid like and we're like it definitely shocked us um this was my buddy's first time going out. I got him kind of just into it. I was like, hey, man, just come out with me one night. I'll take you to some spots. Probably nothing will happen. You know, nine t- 99 out of 100 times, nothing's going to happen. But it's fun to get out. Like, I just love getting out. I love the adventure. Being out in the wilderness just makes me feel better. Um, I have an autoimmune disease that causes a lot of nerve pain. So getting out and getting my mind off of that and getting in nature, I find just helps it. So I'm always out. But, yeah, I took my buddy out there. We see this eye shine about midnight, you know, 11 midnight pop up and just walk sideways into the forest and i would say it was taller than deer it wasn't like eight nine feet tall but it was like crouched and walking off away from us and then we had also seen it in the trees again um and the weird thing about the eye shine with these things is they know how to stay away from you like they're always going to be we had flashlights i shine the light on it and it's always out of the range of the flashlight somehow they know to keep this magical distance from you where you can't identify them or get a light on them or anything, but you can see this eye shine. So I don't know if that was a big or an animal or I know, I don't think there's any elk out there. I know there's deer and mountain lion and stuff, but it was weird. It was just one of those weird instances where you're not really sure what's going on. It could have been, it may not have been, but you'll find that if you're paying it really close attention of your surroundings, you're listening, you're watching, um, you're, you'll find some weird stuff happens. You just got to be out there a lot and pay a lot of attention you could be staring at one of these things in the forest and not even know it because they camouflage so well. And they're dark. They got similar colors. Like, it's crazy. So, yeah, that's, a, you know, another another instance that I've had being out there where I'm not sure if it's a big or not, but it was very, very strange. So. Any questions, anyone? It's quiet. Well, actually, I, I do... Uh, and I and might have missed this because when you first started talking about the school ground and the pool there that you were picking um, mushrooms in, uh, have I got that correct? Um, uh, I had to step away from the phone just for uh, just momentarily. Um, where exactly was that located? And then was there any uh, uh, was there any woods or? forest land around that it could have managed to have uh, maneuver into that uh, park without being seen? Yeah, this this spot is in West Seattle, downtown West Seattle. I'm not going to name the park because it'll just get tramped out. Um, but it, it is a, a wooded park, and the school is up on a hill away from the park. So you have this, it's like a nature preserve park, um, and the school is just up on the hill outside of the park. So the school is actually not part of the park. But the park itself is a very densely wooded forest. Um, And what I think is happening is um, forest, I think they're swimming from across the Puget Sound. I think they're actually making that swim at nighttime in in fall and winter months. Um, And there are are many green belts in this area. And they do travel from green belt to green belt to green belt. And they don't need much. These things can move like you would not believe. And just, you know, in the cover of night, and nobody will ever notice them. It, they only need a little bit of tree. They don't even need very many. So they can go from green belt to green belt to green belt, and they can cover you know, 20 miles probably north to south of Seattle on these green belts because some of these green belts do connect for miles and miles and miles. Um, ultimately, yeah. I, I, ultimately, I think they're swimming across the Puget Sound. Well, yeah, crazy. I've been in the, in the Seattle area lots of times, and just 
there's lots of uh, wooded areas around there. So mm-hmm. even yep, even yeah, between yeah. houses, yeah, you can have. Yeah, it you seems can, to be a continuum up there, and but I, I was just wondering if maybe it was really close to a state park or something like that. But, no, I think uh, all of us we've had plenty of uh, situation uh, occurrences <laughs> with Bigfoot, so we're quite aware of how uh, Bigfoot can, you know, <laughs> move and be right there, and you never even notice them. So anyway. That's yep. a very very typical primate. I'll, I'll I'll share the location with you, Will, privately. Just don't don't give it out, but you can share it amongst okay, your sure. group. Um. So yeah, I mean, I don't know what these things are. You I mean, it is the most fascinating. It's one of the most fascinating subjects because it's real. It's out there. Um, we know it's out there. It's just it is such a mystery. You know, um, people believe they're just relic hominid primates. People believe they're way more than that. People believe. They're aliens. People believe they're genetically engineered. Um, Nephilim hybrids, human hybrids. It doesn't. Everybody has an opinion, right? But at the end of the day, none of us know. We 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 can have strong beliefs as what they are. But that's what's so fascinating, you know. Um, you've been doing this for 40, 50 years. Well, you, you want to know what they are, right? Oh I yeah. Mean, why don't we all love to know exactly what they are? I don't think it's probably going to come out. I I really do believe that the the government knows what these things are. And I firmly believe that is being hidden, covered up, suppressed, whatever you want to say. There's no way in heck that they do not have a good idea or a better idea than we do of what these things are. So to me, that tells me that these things are very special. Um, if it was to come out what they truly are, oh man, it could have all sorts of ramifications and implications that would, you know, turn the world upside down. It, it really could. Um, it could go to our, our origins, our history, who we really are, what we really came from. We don't know. So it's going to take you, – you go on these forums, and I go on all these Facebook forums and posts and people and debate people and everybody. The thing that irks me is that people need an authority figure to tell them what's true and what's not. Like nobody's going to believe in Bigfoot unless the government tells them what's real or the Forest Service comes out and makes a post is real. That's not going to happen. So it's going to be up to people like us that have been investigating us and getting this information out. And I want to get proof. Like, I want to get some decent footage, um, not to be famous or anything. I don't care about that. I just want to raise awareness of this. Like, go out into the woods with your family, but keep an eye on your kids. Don't let them wander off, you know? People need to know that these things are out there. And I think it's not right for people to not know what's out in the woods in these state parks and national parks. Um, so that's that's my main reason is just to wait, raise awareness that these things are real and they do exist and to be careful. So that's kind of why I'm doing this. And, you know, it's it's super fascinating for me. Um, I just love it. Well, Kevin, you and I have to you and I will have to talk privately sometime. Um, I can I can fill in some of those blanks for you, but um, we're running out of time. So we'll wrap here. We appreciate you coming on with us. Yeah, absolutely. I'll keep you guys all in the touch or all in the know. I mean, um, if I find anything, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know um, what I find and I'll, I'll keep you in the loop. Maybe I can actually visit with you. I'm going to be up in that area uh, in late September. So I'll let you know when I'm coming up. Yeah, that'd be awesome. If you want to go out a day or half a day or an afternoon and yeah. you know, look for some prints and just talk or grab some food, that would that'd be wonderful. Absolutely. All right, Kevin, listen, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. All right. Take care, guys. All right, everyone. Bye. All right, bye. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Okay, folks, so here's the audio from Kevin's uh, trip up near Mount Rainier. I'm sure that's not going to work. What the fuck is that? Kevin, turn around. Get the fuck out of here. Please turn around. No, hold on. I'm scared. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. 
All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.